Hello, I'm uh, Jared Motch. I'm very honored to be the recipient of the J.D. Falk 2014 award. Uh, and uh, I want to go and thank the, uh, the board, the uh, awards committee, as well as Return Path for honoring me with this. I wanted to uh, take an opportunity and talk to you for a moment about uh, the reason they gave me the award, which is a, a number of different public projects that I've uh, been participating in. Uh, the Open Resolver project, the Open NTP, and the Open SNMP projects. I want to talk to you briefly about how the scanning uh, for these projects work. Uh, go and scan the internet almost every day of the week for DNS, NTP, and SNMP. I learned a lot in the first couple weeks of performing these projects, not only in the methodologies of scanning, uh, but in what uh, to expect from end sites when they receive the scanning activity. I, I wanted to share with you briefly what a scan actually looks like. The green line is the outbound traffic from the machine performing the scanning, and the red line is the response traffic you see from that. Uh, it's a pretty, for me as a network person, a low bit rate to see 100 megs coming out of a machine. But the very interesting thing for me is how you have this uh, tail of receive activity uh, that continues to come for over an hour afterwards, uh, which is very interesting. So when you're doing these types of activities, the first data was very unusual. So I took a number of steps to validate the results and the output uh, of what we received. And you end up with all these unexpected mysteries, like why am I receiving traffic for an hour afterwards? DNS uses port 53, but you get these responses that come back from some other port. And that accounted for between 46 and 50% of the uh, activity. And we had another 2% uh, of the return traffic that came from an IP address other than the one uh, that was being probed. And from that, we can go and detect and infer spoofing within the networks that we're scanning. And so there's a madness with this method. So with the DNS in particular, uh, you know, a unique query is sent for, to each IP address. Uh, we go ahead and code that uh, with XOR so we can go and reverse it uh, on the far side. And it, as it turns out, uh, as we know in the security industry, software not only has bugs, uh, but you have all of these unexpected behaviors, like the way in which the nodes respond uh, to the traffic they receive. They'll respond multiple times. They'll respond for hours or even days or weeks later uh, from that. So what we learned is that many of the CPE, the home routers at people's homes, respond to the traffic uh, that they receive on the WAN interface when they should really only be responding from uh, the internal machines uh, within the customer home. They'll go and they'll take the DNS queries they receive, they'll forward them to whatever their configured DNS server is, uh, and they'll even go so far as to alter the, the source address in the packet uh, to rewrite that to be the destination, such that the device ends up spoofing the IP address of the scanning machine to the name server that they're set to forward it to, either the service provider or the most common one we see is Google's 8.8.8.8. So when you're dealing with this, there's a number of different remediation methods. Uh, we saw everything from vendors swapping the CPE. Belkin was really amazing on this front. We saw them actually uh, work with service providers and go and swap out the CPE devices in the home uh, of a number of their customers, uh, as well as we saw vendors go and provide firmware fixes. So I'm sorry about a little bit of an eye chart with this. I uh, want to explain the two anomalies. There's two dips in the graph that you can see. Uh, those are because the machine that I was performing the activities on ran out of disk space. But you can see overall here an overall downward trend that goes and shows as the uh, Open Resolver project data over time, you can actually see networks becoming cleaner and fixed over time. And that was really one of the important things for me is trying to quantify what we could see. So I want to talk to you also about NTP. Uh, at the tail end of 2013, beginning of 2014, we saw very large NTP denial of service attacks targeted at a number of different gaming providers as well as CDN networks. And we tried to go and take a close look at this. There's a number of other researchers who did activities, namely Christian Rosso's Amplification Hell paper and Jacob and a number of people at the University of Michigan in their paper about the rise and decline of NTP denial of service attacks, where they talk about how NTP came from this fraction of traffic on the internet to be a significant percentage over the years. And NTP is great if you're an attacker because it provides somewhere between five and a thousand times the amplification. So you can send four bytes and get back 4,000, 
which is really amazing. The support for the feature that they ended up using, this uh, mon list, uh, you know, was removed in April 2010 uh, from NTP, but it takes a long time for people to actually pick up fixed software. At the beginning of 2014, there were about 1.15 million NTP amplifiers on the internet. Over the year, we've seen a rapid remediation of those hosts, so it's just under 200,000 uh, here in October. That is a significant downward trend. Unfortunately, most of that was resolved by network service providers filtering NTP activity uh, entirely from their networks and also through rapid remediation because the NTP attacks were some of the largest that were ever seen. So with NTP version scanning, it gives you pretty detailed information about the host that you're talking to. So there's the mode 7 request, which is the mon list, and there's mode 6, which provides detailed version information about the, the host, which if you're trying to do penetration testing or other types of uh, security evaluations, can be very revealing. iOS XR, for example, provides a very unique, distinct signature uh, output compared to iOS devices, which just return Cisco. Uh, and you can also get pretty detailed information uh, about the host. And so you can see here I included version information from a Broadcom-based uh, Ethernet switch uh, that is exposed on the internet. And you can actually see the build date of the NTP version as well as the individual version that's uh, running there, which does not include the fix for the NTP mon list. So let's get really personal here. You, you can tell the Juniper version of software. You can see that people are running VMware, Big IP, uh, and you can see really interesting information and insights into the CPE that are used uh, in the home, which takes us over to SNMP data. So the SNMP data actually gets to be really interesting because you have these management uh, protocols being exposed directly on the internet. The most common guides on the internet just give the example communities of public and private. Uh, we started scanning in June of this year, uh, get about 10, 6 to 10 gigs of data a week, and there's over 7 million hosts that responded uh, at the beginning of October. So we have similar challenges with embedded solutions and small devices uh, from the service pr processors that are included in servers uh, to just a variety of different network equipment that's out there. And it can be very revealing, just like the NTP data. So the most interesting one for me is these NTCIP signs, uh, which there's a paper written at the University of Michigan about green lights forever, where it talks about this, this standard protocol and the way in which you can interact with all of these traffic control devices. I found numerous devices of this type exposed directly on the internet uh, behind cellular data and a variety of other communications methods. And it will only be so long until somebody figures out how to remotely change these uh, from a different continent uh, than they're currently connected to uh, and cause uh, the zombie apocalypse or other things. So when you talk about these projects and how we actually originally started doing this, this really started out as a project for, for me at my employer at NTT trying to look at the ongoing attack measurement. I consulted with our security team and I was trying to really get a good idea of what percentage of the hosts that were uh, participating in these attacks were actually known and to try and quantify them. What it eventually transformed into over time is a way for us to go and share this data publicly with a variety of different organizations. Everyone one from national computer emergency response teams to trying to provide public access to the data for people to remediate it, as well as for service providers to come provide their ASN and get direct reporting about the machines within their network that require remediation. And we've tried to work carefully with researchers uh, such that they can publish papers from the drive data. Uh, and that's something w for which I take a, a, you know, a great deal of interest uh, in, in trying to read that. So much so that even though these scans only take a few hours every day, we get people who email us trying to go and get a response about the data that we have and sharing it and trying to collaborate. Unfortunately, some of the people uh, email from pseudonyms, like this one from Bacon Zombie. You know, you can see the geek cred in there where he's providing old Commodore 64 information in a signature file. And I really try to help people like this, uh, including the undead, but unfortunately sometimes you'll get a response from me that's not quite favorable, uh, where I inform them that, you know, I really want to know who they are before I go and share the information, even though it's relatively easy to put it together after a few hours. 
So trust can be very difficult yet necessary when you're dealing with data sets like this. These types of emerging threats that are continuing to come out, uh, sometimes on a weekly or monthly basis, uh, really require cooperation. You really need to communicate with others in the industry about what to do. Sharing data, I've really been surprised and amazed in some of the unexpected successes in working with the national response teams as well as with vendors. There's some of them that I've been really amazed at uh, in what they can do. Uh, I, I'm disturbed at times to find out that you know I've become the expert in a number of these protocols. I really feel like it should not be me, uh, but I, I've learned over time that becoming the expert is valuable in that you can seek the insights in, uh, that are available in the data and really uh, delve into that deeply. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity I've had to do that. And this long tail of remediation ultimately ends up being years. I remember seeing working on Smurf amplification remediation uh, over a decade ago and trying to go and get defaults changed, improve uh, the software and configurations of devices. And it's ultimately a years and years long process as demonstrated by uh, the open resolver graph. So with, with that, I wanna once again thank the board, the awards committee and return path. I really wish I could have been here in Boston with you. Uh, and I'm happy to take any follow-up questions you have via email uh, and enjoy the rest of MOG.